about five years ago with Tim Leary, one raucous evening. Maybe some of you managed to catch that event. Uh, this is a little more thoughtful and uh, reflective. I'm not here to talk or to speak or to promote my books as I have been in the past. Uh, this is the only public event that I'm doing in these 10 days. And I'm very grateful uh, to David and Petra for inviting me. This is a wonderful facility and bringing you uh, plants and books and information. It's great to see that uh, Freak community is uh, alive and well in Mannheim. Uh, what I'm in Europe to do is to be part of a film-making effort. And I want to describe the project to you a little bit, simply because it's what's on my mind, naturally, and to discuss the politics behind the making of this kind of a film. Uh, it, it's not a film about rave culture. It's not a film about Albert Hoffman. It's uh, not... Uh, a film about uh, body piercing or any of these things that great films need to be done about and have been done about. Uh, it's about one of your local heroes who is a great hero of mine and should be uh, a great hero to all freaks in Germany and everywhere. And I'm talking about uh, Frederick V, Elector Palatine, Prince of Heidelberg, King of Bohemia. Are you all familiar with this guy? Who? No. no? Oh well, this this is your guy. This is the prototypic freak of this area, and a freak who was not content to sit back and let things happen, but was willing to launch a grand alchemical dream of uh, a reformation of human society. So just to lay in the background for those of you who are not familiar, the historical incident that we're here to recreate here and later in Prague uh, has to do with the Prince Palatine of Heidelberg, a Protestant who wedded the granddaughter of Queen Elizabeth I of England Elizabeth Stuart, the daughter of James I of England. This was an arranged wedding. They were both 16 years old at the time. Uh, Frederick went to England. The wedding was held in England. And then he returned with his very English bride uh, to Heidelberg. And they were the center of a movement of alchemical reformation and revolution that sought to take the Protestant Reformation an enormous leap forward into a new world of spiritual uh, freedom and, uh, to my mind, uh, a very sort of psychedelic world. They were the heirs, the inheritors of the entire medieval worldview. It was folded in to this pair of 16-year-olds who were ruling the Palatinate of Heidelberg. And, and Frederick was an elector, meaning he was one of the seven princes who could choose uh, the emperor of, the, of what remained of the Holy Roman Empire at that time. And he conspired to become the king of Bohemia, the visionaries, moved the entire court from Heidelberg, from the small time scene of, of, uh, of a principality, to Prague, to reoccupy the, uh, the office of the Holy Roman Empire with an emperor friendly to magic and alchemy, who was the inheritor of a generation old plan to create an alchemical reformation that had been hatched in the mind of the English alchemist and mathematician John Dee. And the ending of the story is not a happy ending, or perhaps it is. I mean, we can t 
talk about that. Uh, on a superficial level, they, this alchemical dream, this Rosicrucian enlightenment, ended badly because the Habsburgs back in Madrid quickly got wind of what was going on and got an army together and sent it to Prague and laid siege to Prague and uh, Elizabeth fled to the Netherlands with her children. Frederick uh, was defeated at the Battle of the White Mountain and the alchemical dream died. And this was really, in some sense, the beginning of the Thirty Years' War. And as you know, going into the Thirty Years' War, Europe was a place of popes and kings. At the end of the Thirty Years' War, it was a place ruled by parliaments and peoples. And the entire medieval world was swept away. And out of uh, the, the new political dispensation of, uh, of the situation at the end of the Thirty Years' War, especially in England, modern science took hold and was born. And these angel-dealing, horoscope-casting, alchemy-pursuing visionaries uh, of this re Rosicrucian Renaissance became simply objects of historical curiosity, completely incomprehensible to the people who followed them generation after generation after generation until I submit to you uh, the present. And in the present moment, we, like they, inherit a world whose ideologies are uh, exhausted and can only be refreshed from the margins. And that was what this whole uh, chemical revolt was about. It was, it was about a, a, a suppressed marginal minority of deeply pietistic original thinkers, but heterodox, non-Christian, keeping together a tradition that I think has been reborn or rediscovered in our own time. And it's the tradition that uh, nature is uh, a great distillery of uh, complexity, alchemical gold, novelty, connection, whatever you want to call it, uh, in our own time, through, through integrative sciences like ecology and uh, animal behavior and psychology, we have re-understood what was forgotten during the reductionist centuries of modern science. We have re-understood that uh, the world is one thing, and it's a living thing. It's a thing with an intent and a spirit within it. And this is the key concept, the concept that the alchemists and the hermetic dreamers and the occultists of the uh, alchemical and northern European Renaissance, they were trying to, re they were trying to um, strengthen and condense and distill and make actual this sense of community, this spiritus, well then with the rise of modern science, all of that is uh, anathema. And rational analysis tells us that uh, matter is simply atoms flinging its, themselves through space, obedient to certain mathematical laws that are invariant. And all the creativity all the sense of connectedness that we experience as living beings, as members of a society, as human beings in contemplation of nature, all of that was denied. And it reaches its uh, ultimate culmination, just as an example, in a, the kind of statement such as was made by Jean-Paul Sartre, the French existentialist, who said, nature is mute. 
You understand what I mean? Nature gives no clue, he tells you. Man is alone in the cosmos with his complexes and his obsessions. He confers meaning. There is no, uh, there is no a priori reality to which ethics or intent can be attached. I reject this. I think the entire message of the psychedelic experience, which is basically the, the sine qua non of the rebirth of alchemical understanding, the, the very basis of that understanding is that nature seeks to communicate. All being uh, is pregnant with language. All reality wants to include uh, the, the, the human side of nature in its ongoing intent. The problem lies not with nature, but with ourselves, that we are somehow uh, paralyzed, disempowered, doubting, cut from the, uh, the meat of the thing. Well, so I'm a great believer in propaganda, obviously. I mean, my whole life is about propaganda. So to take an incident like the career of Frederick the Elector Palatine of Heidelberg and his bride and make of it uh, a kind of exemplar, a parable, a myth, if you will, uh, the myth of the alchemical marriage, a myth that takes innocence and naivete and uh, belief in the power of ideas to make a new world and tell that story again in film, backing it with these tremendously powerful alchemical images that uh, Jung and others showed work inexorably on the psyche, whether you wish to be part of the process or not, to merely gaze upon the images of alchemy is to, in a sense, enter into a kind of psychoanalytical process because what alchemy was, and I should stress this or the rap makes no sense at all, alchemy was not the vulgar pursuit of the transmutation of lesser metals into gold or silver. That was uh, the charlatan's game played in every market in Europe for centuries uh, among the simple people. But the body of symbols and of literature that accreted around the effort to extract a universal medicine out of nature for the transformation of societies and human beings uh, was in those times of what we call epistemological naivete, meaning that they did not have the strong sense of objective and subjective reality, which we inherit from science. So during those years of epistemological naivete, what was someone's idea about how matter behaves what was someone's myth of how psyche behaves could become entangled in a projective experience with uh, uh, material in a chemical vessel. So the processes which we call uh, melting and crystallinization and purification and calcinization, processes now well understood through a soulless molecular model of matter were for them the birth of the red lion, the coming of the, of the double-headed queen, uh, the murder of the hermaphrodite dog, and so forth and so on. They had these outlandish images and outlandish vocabulary because they were trying to create powerful <coughs> symbols, powerful mnemonic hooks on which to hold uh, the, the, the details 
and there are many of them, of this extremely complex worldview that were it not for people like Carl Jung, the Swiss depth psychologist, would have remained completely inexplicable to modern people. It is not chemistry, and it is not myth-building per se, as we inherit from the Greeks. It's a very complicated amalgamation, good alchemical word, very complicated <coughs> amalgamation of psyche and matter. And the reason I think it is so resonant with our own times is because our generation, generations of people confined within the 20th century, have in a sense, and by an oblique path, recovered that universal medicine that the alchemists dreamed of by going, strangely enough, uh, to some of the most aboriginal and least culturally assimilated to European and American values people in the world. Shamanism is essentially a living tradition of alchemy that is not seeking the stone, but has found the stone. These shamans, these Hibaro, these Witoto, these Cubeo, notice that they have this same epistemic naivete, this inability to distinguish between subjective and objective world through the intercession of Newton and Descartes, uh, that Frederick the Elector and the alchemists around him and the alchemists that preceded them through the centuries had. Uh, in other words, within the context of uh, the alchemical vocabulary, the psychedelic experience as brought to us through plants, long in the possession of aboriginal people, appears to be the identical uh, phenomenon. Uh, the Hivaro shaman, the Cubeo shaman, does not use a glass retort with cycling sulfur and mercury inside it. Uh, the shamans of the Amazon have uh, attained a sufficient sophistication to explicitly understand that the vessel of alchemical transformation is the body and the head of the experience. This is the alchemical vessel. This is where you will encounter the three-headed dog and the queen dissolving in her bath and the incestuous couple that combine soul and luna to produce the white essence of the panacea of the universal medicine. These are psycho-mental processes. And uh, uh, Jung, strangely enough, was he must have been an extraordinary person because he could approach this without psychedelics through a very careful inspection of the dreams and the symbol-producing processes of his patients over decades. He produced a kind of skeletal map of the psyche. But I maintain in, in that map doesn't fill itself in, doesn't become a living experience until we undergo what is rightly perceived as the alchemical process of dissolution. Dissolution of what? Of the lumpen prima materia of the ego. This is the, the, the shit, the tar, the coal, the dark earth of Egypt, the starting <coughs> material, the loam, the manure, the night soil, the lowest matter, and we start with that, the ego, and dissolve it through the intercession of the spirit. And spirit is a complicated concept. It's not naive. It's phenomenologically difficult to define, but through the dissolving spirit of the plants. And the plants lift the 
the imprisoning structures of the ego, and the ego flows out into the world. And for some people, this produces panic. Panic comes from the god Pan, whose screams caused people to go mad. Panic. Uh, for other people, it's an enormous liberation. In any case, uh, it, it is an influx of material previously hidden in the unconscious, laden with symbolic meaning, and eventually not to be um, sustained in this acidic, dissolving, roiling, liquid state. That's part of the process. But then eventually to be recombined, coagulatio, the recombining, the coagulation, the coming together at a higher level, usually through the application of a process analogous to heat, but psychic heat, which drives off the dross of false assumptions and uh, false attachments. And all of you who have been through high-dose psychedelic experiences know that it's very hard to carry stupid baggage through that keyhole. Uh, in fact, it's just, you're lucky if you just get your soul uh, and yourself through and intact. Uh, so what we have here, through the psychedelics, among certain marginal populations in the 20th century, uh, freaks of all sorts in all times and places within the 20th century, a kind of almost accidental rediscovery of these alchemical truths. Well, okay, so that's good. That's one level. We can do self-directed psychotherapy on ourselves with psychedelic substances out of plants, and we can use uh, alchemical symbolism to guide this process, and that's all very interesting. And But so what? I mean, what's so great about it? Well, I think... Uh, there's a, a f one of the most famous of all alchemical axioms is as above, so below, meaning always that in every small part of reality, there is a tiny reflection of the great overstructure of reality. And in the largest structures are hidden the secrets of the smallest and vice versa. We also have rediscovered this principle in the 20th century through fractal mathematics. Uh, but the psychedelics have brought us back to this alchemical mystery, shorn of any vocabulary for, for dealing with it, shorn of any real living notion of the spirit. And so we have sought as far afield as the Tibetan Book of the Dead or uh, Freudianism or uh, there, there have been various efforts to cast the psychedelic experience one way or another. The hot one now, uh, of course, is shamanism. And I relate to that because I spend a lot of time in the Amazon and with these kinds of people with these kinds of concerns. But shamanism and alchemy are a seamless enterprise. Uh, alchemy, uh, the connecting figure, if you're interested in this, between the shaman and the alchemist is the smith, the worker of metal. And the, the, the shaman and the alchemist, I mean, I'm sorry, the shaman and the smith in primitive cultures are always associated as brother figures. Uh, they both work in metals. Well, what all this means for us beyond the commitment to our own sort of ordering the Wunderkammer of our own private imagination, what it means is uh, important because if you look around you, the entire global civilization is undergoing some kind of meltdown. Uh, the planet itself 
is now to be seen as a kind of alchemical retort. The prima materia to be transformed are the nuclear stockpiles, the toxic waste dumps, the industrial wastelands, the populations devoid of hope, the uh, populations uh, uh, at threat of infectious and fatal epidemic disease. Uh, there is a, a great deal of prima materia to be worked on at the historical level of the alchemical process. Trying to manage this <laughs> rationally with some political ism, fascism, Marxism, capitalism, it goes nowhere. It just digs us deeper into the mire and uh, the muck. At the fringes, people like yourselves, people like myself, people I associate, offer endless solutions. Recycling, restraint in childbearing, uh, increased uh, sexual, you know, toleration of unusual sexual styles. Many, many things are suggested, but nothing happens because the primary agenda of society has not yet been dissolved.